looking through this broader lens, I want to now turn uh, to our panelists and get an initial overview f f from each of you as to what you see as the major threats that Europe faces and with any particular implications this has in terms of the, the architecture of how we go about how, how we go, go about responding to them. And I might begin with Alexander, drawing on your experience of crisis management in the PSC the last few years for perhaps, and also maybe drawing a little bit on your uh, obviously close understanding of the country that you know best uh, to give us an, an initial overview. Thank you. Uh, good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks uh, uh, that I was in, invited uh, to this discussion. Uh, and thank you for the very kind in introduction uh, before. I will, of course, uh, not speak on behalf of Austria, but as you say, that's the country I know best. I've been sort of brainwashed over, f over 50 years. Uh, so I will, of course, bring an Austrian perspective. And some of my points have also been drawn from a recent publication from the Austrian <coughs> Ministry of Defense. Um, I thought about how to start a uh, discussion like that in Dublin, and I thought the good way to start is, is with Brexit, because I'm, I'm sure that you uh, still love to talk about Brexit. Um, one of the 2017 Brexit quotes from uh, Politico was that there are two kinds of European nations. There are small nations, and there are countries that have not yet realized that they are small nations. Uh, that was said by the then Danish finance minister, Christian Jensen, in a conference on the topic road to Brexit. It caused quite a bit of anger from the UK. Um, uh, but, uh, and of course, the context of that conference was entirely different from the discussion today, but I still think it's a good starting point uh, to look at threats to small states, because um, what are small states? What's the definition of a small state? Um, the geostrategic developments in, the, in, in recent years uh, have, of course, fundamentally changed the international order, and uh, that has high relevance for the European integration project as a whole and for EU member states individually. Um, we probably can expect uh, uh, in the foreseeable future an international security environment that's characterized by more confrontational multipolarity by rivalry and by conflicts <coughs> between regional and global powers and increasing non-state actor importance as well. Um, additional sort of global drivers with, with security or insecurity implications uh, are climate change, demographic developments, economic dynamics uh, and changes, and also potentially new disruptive uh, technologies and I would say, it was also mentioned before, the threat of disintegration of global institutions and the rules-based international system and more broadly, multilateralism as a whole, as a concept uh, of, of, uh, of, and a principle of international cooperation. So security challenges, risks and threats for Europe are today more complex, more interconnected <coughs> and less predictable than before. And uh, in our globalized age, regional events have immediately global implications, um, and uh, that's, that has all accelerated. So these challenges are faced by EU member states uh, uh, and as a whole, and no EU member state is capable to address them alone. So close cooperation, integration of efforts is inevitable, and viewed against this, global trends and challenges, I would say that uh, all states in Europe are small. Um, so um, there are, of course, uh, um, differences in capabilities, but the challenges are so complex and so um, interconnected and, and complex that uh, um, they beyond the capacity of any European state. Um, armed attacks in the sort of tra traditional sense uh, involving massive land uh, uh, air, sea assets, uh, maybe are considered relatively unlikely today. So current threat perceptions and um, anticipated hostile actions are expected to be to occur more on the subconventional level, below an international law threshold uh, of an armed conflict, which are, of course, uh, hybrid uh, threats, hybrid actions. And such hybrid opponents will have to be faced both uh, domestically 
uh, as well as abroad, but most importantly, of course, through international cooperation. And uh, geography matters, of course. Um, the location of European states uh, uh, influences threat perceptions, and Ireland's threat perceptions will, of course, differ from the one of Austria or from the one of the Baltic states. Um, but uh, there is a sort of non-exhaustive list of, of, uh, of uh, threats uh, facing all European states uh, and in no particular order, um, one could say um, export of extremism and terrorism to Europe. Um, certainly in Austria, threat perception of mass, migrat uh, mass migratory movement is seen very much in the security context. Um, possible strategic shocks for the economy, for states and society. Um, increasing hybrid uh, threats by Russia and by other non-European powers, including on the democratic structures and democratic culture uh, within the EU. But even without uh, hybrid uh, actions from external actors, the domestic stability, um, domestic uh, um, right-wing, left-wing, populist uh, threats to the democratic structures, to the uh, uh, fabric of society, uh, of course a threat as well. Maybe not so much in the sort of international context, but we can see that these threats are faced in many European countries and in many Western democracies. So they certainly, in my view, fit into an overall discussion on, on threats. Um, <coughs> Further deterioration of the Ukraine conflict, of course. Then, very much from the Austrian perspective, the proximity of the Western Balkans, uh, further stalling, um, losing steam of uh, Western Balkan approach to the European institutions, to the European uh, structures and uh, standards, leading to further fragmentation, instability, more organized crime, uh, increased influence of, of third states. Then, as was mentioned before, the deterioration of the transatlantic relationship is, of course, uh, very much on our minds. Um, but in addition to that, the sort of increasing confrontational relationship between the US and Russia, and increasingly also with China, and what does it mean for Europe in terms of European unity, in terms of European member states being torn in different directions. That's, a, in my perspective, a very, um, <coughs> very uh, disconcerting potential there. Um, then, of course, I see that also from the Baltic perspective, uh, threat perception, potentially even uh, um, immediate military strategic threats uh, to some EU member states, uh, and I fully acknowledge that from the Baltic perspective that probably looks entirely different the way it looks from Austria. Um, then, which wasn't touched before, if you look at the, if you look around Europe, uh, we talk in the PSC about an arch of instability, which uh, goes from basically North Africa, Sahel, Horn of Africa, the entire Middle East, Gulf region, Caucasus, uh, Ukraine. So we are surrounded by an arch of insecurity and instability with, of course, uh, um, uh, tremendous uh, threat and security potential for Europe and uh, currently still inadequate EU conflict prevention and stabilization capacities. Then um, I have to say that with my past, uh, the breakdown of existing arms control arrangements, uh, and certainly in Europe now with the demise of the INF Treaty, uh, renewed nuclear arms race, including stationing of, mid of medium range uh, nuclear missiles in Europe, uh, I consider to be an uh, absolutely existential threat and terrible deterioration of, uh, or at least the potential of it, um, of, uh, of security in Europe. Um, and then, and I think that is particularly pertinent for smaller European member states, uh, the disintegration of global institutions and the rules-based international system, including core values such as human rights, 
upon which the European Union integration project is based. So these challenges for Europe uh, as a whole and for EU member states require a comprehensive and cross-cutting security policy approach in which uh, civil and military and external and internal security is closely integrated. Um, and this, of course, exceeds classical security providers such as the military or internal security actors and includes actors and instruments in the diplomatic, military, um, social integration, development, environmental, financial, infrastructure, education, information, communication and health policy fields. Um, on the security uh, um, uh, and defense cooperation in the EU as a whole over the last few years, I want to pick up briefly on, on points that were made uh, by uh, Dr. Wright before. It is a complicated uh, uh, discussion for the EU. There is, of course, an element of hedging because we all concerned where the transatlantic relationship is going to go. So the idea of uh, uh, building up um, further in more independent EU capacities is widely accepted and the logic behind it is pertinent. Uh, I fully acknowledge and we see this in the EU discussions that uh, certainly Eastern European countries but not only are particularly concerned uh, uh, that this could be perceived as uh, negative in Washington and sort of exacerbate a potential trend of disengagement. But I want to bring in as well the perspective certainly of Austria and I believe also of Ireland, that the more the EU uh, military and defense cooperation is put into the NATO context, the more complicated that actually makes it for countries like mine, uh, where, where, um, NATO, where uh, NATO cooperation is seen positively, but maybe not too closely. So it's a, it's a, it's a political balancing act which is extremely um, challenging. Um, so I want to close uh, uh, by saying that um, it's justified and it's correct that the EU is putting lots of effort into enhancing and integrating uh, its military defense capabilities. Um, but I would say that the EU focus on a broad security definition and broad security policy approach uh, must be retained. Thank you. Okay.